am joined by Yun Fen, the creator of Number Seven Cherry Lane, Welcome. and I'm really thrilled to be speaking with you. Uh, we're we're about 13 hours apart right now, yeah. uh, but let's just keep the conversation going since yeah. we've already begun. Uh -huh. So uh, let me let me ask you the first question I had is how is it that you arrived at animation after your roughly fifteenth feature film? Yeah, uh, you know what is it that attracted you to animation and this particular story? Yeah, because I think um, since um, Prince of Tears, my previous uh, live action movie, I was quite um, uh, disillusioned by the real uh, uh, live action movie because I think that. Uh, Life action movie doesn't well. It's you spend a lot of um, time and uh, uh, money on building the sets and uh, then uh, making the costumes and uh, serving uh, a lot of trailers, uh, serving the stars. And what a waste! So I uh, so I stopped for about ten years of uh, live action movie, and uh, so I think it must be a good way to do something that is cinematically uh, well done and yet to try to be uh, environmental friendly. And so I think of uh, um, animation because I myself, I love paintings. And I think that painting has always been in my mind and uh, that I want to do something wonderfully with uh, uh, the paintings. So I start thinking of uh, doing the animation because in, the, in our way of filmmaking, every second you have 24 frames and the 24 frames should be paintings. So if you keep on doing this and then you have so many wonderful paintings and combine together and uh, it's, uh, imagine, uh, uh, it's very imaginative and also it's very um, uh, environmental uh, uh, friendly. I think that is probably the first thing that I was thinking of. Mm. And then I think that uh, uh, because uh, making the animation, you can have a lot of imagination in the paintings and that the paintings last forever long if it is good painting. So I start doing the, uh, paint, uh, uh, the paintings with um, uh, the um, uh, charcoal pencil on rice paper because mm -hmm. I, in that way, that all the background and you have much more texture and all that. And then it can be a very uh, imaginative. And yet this movie, it's almost like a, a real life, uh, I mean, a live action movie because you see the figures and then they talk and then they move. It is exactly like a, a real movie. So that is a very good uh, challenge. and. Uh, also, I think that is something that has never been done before. Yeah. Well, let me, before we, I certainly want to talk to you about painting, obviously, since uh -huh. we're presenting this in the context of the Museum of Modern Art, it's only appropriate yeah. that we talk about painting, uh, as well as the process by which you animated the film. But before we do that, let me just ask you, because you've talked about how it's, you know, that setting aside the environmental concerns, of course, of making a live action film, that it has its own share of difficulties, but certainly this was a challenge for you in the sense of having to work with storyboards, having yeah. to work with a very protracted period of production time, I think a number of years as opposed to months. So uh, I suppose you were obviously mentally prepared for this, but did you imagine it was going to take as long and, and uh, have so many sort of not dead ends necessarily, but I know you started, for example, with rotoscoping live actors and found yeah. you were dissatisfied with the look. And so you yeah. turned to other methods. So did yeah. you imagine when you set out to make this that there were going to be so many challenges along the way in terms of how you would arrive at your final aesthetic? Yeah, I think this is a really wonderful thing for me to do because I never, never touched anything about animation. And I know that animation is expensive, but, uh, but I want to try to do something different. So I get my first animator and uh, he is just one person and sitting in, in front of the, uh, his uh, uh, computer and uh, doing drawings. And I said, I want to do this, blah, 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 blah. And so that can you assemble the uh, people for me and uh, doing the drawings, things like that. 
I find it's quite amazing because he assembled about 30 illustrators and then doing the, uh, uh, I mean, uh, background, uh, the background uh, drawings for, uh, for me. And so I, I, I think you uh, received, you have looked at the books that we did for the drawing. Right. They're beautiful. Yeah, about four years of work because every small detail is hand drawn. And um, uh, those uh, artists, they are not from Hong Kong. So they live in Taiwan and they live in China. But then they all came to Hong Kong to feel that Hong, how Hong Kong, the, uh, the, uh, the life temple of Hong Kong. And uh, so uh, when they started drawing it, and uh, so you have, of course, you have a lot of reference, but the most important thing is I was born, in, uh, I, I was living through all this period in Hong Kong during the 60s. So I know what it is uh, uh, Hong Kong in the 60s and then, and besides, I am a control freak. <laughs> I control them. So I tell them that uh, if you draw this building or if you draw that corner of the street, all those things, it has to be look alike, but not copy the exact one. So, in, so I think the one thing that I achieved quite uh, brilliantly, if I may say so, is uh, the pictures, the scenes, the way they deliver. It looks familiar Hong Kong in the 60s, yet it is not really, really Hong Kong in the 60s. And so I call it uh, postmodern because then you can have much more imagination. It is not copied directly mm -hmm. from the scenes and the, uh, uh, the drawings from the Hong Kong old buildings or the way they dress and the things like that. But then you can have much more imagination because I think art should have a lot of imagination. Did, did the hand-drawn line of each animator yeah. create nuanced differences? Obviously, we're gonna talk for, in a moment about the many different animation styles that you use, uh -huh. but it did occur to me watching it, given how many animators you had just doing the hand-drawn uh, uh -huh. aspect of it, did each bring a kind of nuanced difference based on their own uh, their own tremulous line, their own, the quirks of their own style? Yeah, I think that uh, being as a movie director, I told them exactly what I want. So in this movie that you have a very um, many different way of drawing. For instance, you have uh, the French impressionistic uh, kind of uh, uh, oil uh, drawings and then you have Rousseau, and then you have uh, the Chinese woodblock prints, yeah. and then you have uh, 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 then you have Lichtenstein uh, style of uh, pop art, and mm -hmm. mixed everything together. Because personally, that I love paintings. I visit all the museums and all that. It, everything is in my head, and so I want to combine everything that I had. Uh, since I was uh, very young up to now, and then offer it to uh, the, uh, the, uh, the people. So they could feel that this, uh, this painting is from Erte, whom I know personally very well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, uh, that part probably is uh, from uh, Lichtenstein, or then the rest, uh, uh, another part, is from uh, the Chinese wood block and all those combined together. But then it is very challenging because you have to find your own style. And my own style is, I don't want my animation look like a Japanese 2D, nor I would not, definitely, I would not like to have a, a 3D uh, kind of uh, uh, animation in this movie because personally, I think a 3D takes away many of your imaginations. And uh, so this uh, movie is a combination of uh, many visual arts. Yet, you know, in, China, uh, in Chinese cooking, we have a dish called the Buddha's delight. So you put all the ingredients together and you try to make a, a dish. 
and then if you fail this dish, then it will become uh, the chop suey from from the uh, Chinese uh, supermarket. <laughs> Otherwise, if you do it right, then it is uh, uh, Buddha's delight. So in this animation, not only the paintings, but also the music. I have all kinds of music. You have uh, Western string, full orchestra, and then you have uh, Latin drums like Wonka Wise and uh, used to uh, uh, like in his movies. And then you have a Chinese opera, and then you have a very strange sound. And then you have a rap. And oh, my God, how can you have a rap song, a, a street music song in 60s? That doesn't exist. I, mean, I made a list actually, you're, you're, you're way ahead of me because I had made a list from Chinese opera to jazz to Jim Reeves' Am I That Easy to Forget, the great country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, that is very great, costly, you know. I never know. Great it. country music, and then you have the Drunken Concubine performed uh, yeah. by Master Ma. I mean, it really just careens from one uh, genre to the next, but they are of a piece in some sense, not only because they're your taste, your sensibility, but yeah. of course they all in some way deal with uh, elusive love or uh -huh. uh, unattainable love. And yeah. in some way they have some sense of loss and fantasy intertwined. All of yeah. the songs, it seemed to me. So there's, yeah. a, there's a consistency to the, to the theme of the music in spite of the fact that they're so broadly different in genre. Yeah. I think the most important thing for a writer or a filmmaker or whoever is going to do something uh, uh nice about the literature or whatsoever you have to find your own sense of uh, rhythm and uh, so i think that through all the years uh, the movies i make or the things i write i try to find um, uh, this sense of rhythm and so finally i think i've got it and so i am very daring to try to do this uh, animation is to follow the rhythm. So let me just, let's delve into the, the process because I think that may not be obvious to, the, to our audience mm -hmm. how you arrived at this transition from 3D animation to 2D animation. Uh -huh. and, and, and specifically, not only, maybe you could say what that process is, but uh -huh. say specifically what it, what it evokes, what the effect is. Yeah. Uh -huh. That moving from 3D to 2D, instead of going straight to 2D. Uh, have, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, why go through, why, why have 3D before you even bother to go straight to 2D? Why, yeah. what's, the need, what's the need for it? Yeah. You know, time changed so fast because when I first started, uh, to doing the animation, we were starting to uh, doing the background uh, drawings. And then uh, at that time, it was uh, still very fashionable that you get uh, real actors. They do the movements and then they do uh, all the things and that the animators, they just copy what was, uh, uh, what were, were they doing? And then the, uh, they draw it in the, the 2D. And, uh, but, but, but uh, I also learned that uh, uh, in the genuine 2D in the old days, they have a book and then you have to write down every second how they move and how they uh, talk and the, the way uh, they do. And uh, then that, that is the old fashioned way. But then you develop into the kind of uh, uh, shooting a live action and then try to uh, copy the live action. But uh, we did uh, a great deal part of uh, uh, the live action, having the actors to, uh, uh, to act like a real movie, but I was still not very satisfied. So when I took our project to uh, uh, Beijing and my um, uh, master animator, he looked at everything, he said, Mr. Yang, I think this movie is very special. I think I should do this movie in 3D for you. I said, yes, because uh, 3D, uh, the, uh, the, uh, if it is done in 3D, you have to build up the characters. 
every character and it's very complicated and costly. And, but then I said, I don't want 3D. So I said, don't worry. After the 3D, we will hand draw it from 3D to 2D to give you the imagination that you want. Mm -hmm. So I think that is a very good idea because uh, finally I still have the 2D. So on the process that we were uh, doing the 3D, so I stayed in Beijing for about three months and then talking to the animators and when they were building the uh, uh, 3D characters and all that, and then how they move, for instance, if you move this way, how fast, or you want the, the, the slower or everything, even the teardrops, how uh, Mrs. Yu had her teardrops on her eyes, slower or faster, you can control them mm. on the 3D animation. So after we did everything on 3D, I said, oh, this is wonderful. I, this is the exact way I want. Then they draw it from the 3D to 2D. It's a long process, but and a costly. But I think that gives uh, a director who has a uh, hundred percent control. Uh, I mean, uh, um, a feeling that you can do it. So I think this movie, I cannot complain to all the uh, movements or every small detail, every small movement that they do. It is not what I want. Yeah, so I, I, had a, I had a movie that all the actors, their movements is exactly what I want. I mean, I think one of the things you're, you're getting at that I found so beautiful about the film is that it gave you, moving from 3D to 2D, uh -huh. enabled you to experiment with different frame rates, different speeds, yeah. and also different levels of depth yeah. So you can have some sequences, you know, in the way that you experiment with collage. And so, you know, of course, yeah. it brings you to, you know, so that you can have absolutely flat cardboard figures moving yeah. through a space. Uh -huh. and other sequences have them um, much more rounded, much more shadowed, so that uh -huh. you do have a sense of, of, of depths of field and different layers of space. Yeah. So my sense was, and maybe you can confirm or not, that one of the reasons to move from 3D to 2D as a concept is that it, it, it makes it even more possible to experiment with depth and, spa and speed, frame rates, and, yeah. and the ways in which you can move, you can experiment with the flat space of a painting yeah. in motion. Yeah, it is very true because actually, you know, this uh, movie, I have uh, also combined a lot of uh, uh, dramas, a lot of uh, theaters uh, that I, uh, I see that uh, put them into this mo uh, movie. For instance, like uh, the cup of uh, movement, it is the shadow, uh, uh, shadow play that we have uh, in the um, uh, Chinese and the Indonesia. And you then you have, it's like, very static movement. And then I think the most um, uh, interesting thing about this uh, uh, movie is in many parts, I have 24 frames per second uh, uh, regular movement. But I think probably for some of the uh, 2D, anima uh, 2D animation uh, and, uh, lovers, they think it is too slow because nowadays the Japanese, they use 12 or 16 frames per second. Yeah, so this is, uh, you can have uh, the traditional 24 frames per second. And then later on, you develop into the um, Simon Signore part. And then it was like, uh, uh, I deliberately do it on the uh, seven frames per second. Mm -hmm. So it is like a static, you have a, kind of a, a, a stop motion. Yeah, which Wong Gawa is uh, uh, using a lot of in his previous movies. And then you have uh, this always, mm -hmm. all, uh, 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 the cardboard type of uh, moving. So the, uh, the character is like a gliding, there's yeah. a move. Yeah, I think the whole thing is in my mind because I, I just put a lot of um, reference, for instance, uh, 
even I have the kabuki uh, type of uh, influence in this movie, for instance, in kabuki, you have the actors, they don't sing, but then you have people chanting, and then the actors, they were doing the uh, uh, movements according to uh, uh, to uh, uh, to the music, to the uh, lyrics that they were they were ch uh, chanting. Yeah, so it's a lot of combinations of art. <laughs> it's, it's interesting also because I suppose that experimenting with different frame rates, different speeds, also evokes different levels of reality which of course yes. is central to the film, this kind of fever dream that uh -huh. the film unfolds in. You know, we don't necessarily dream at 24 frames a second. Yeah. And so things move differently in different levels of our consciousness, I imagine. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't know, I can't generalize about how everyone dreams, but it seems to me that you don't necessarily dream the way you experience reality. So I think that the way that you, you convey these different levels of reality is, is helped by that. Yeah, that is the reason why I call my first chapter a dream charade. Mm. It is it is a maze and it's like a dream. You walk into this dream, you never know what is going to happen. So many people, they watch this movie and said, oh my God, what is this movie? It's not the thing we usually want to uh, watch or we usually uh, used to, but mm. It is a dream charade. Mm. Yeah. So let's get to the, to the specifics of the film itself. I wanted, maybe you could, for context, say a little bit about where you were in 1967, the kind of person you remember having been, the kind of life you were living. I mean, were you experiencing any kind of political or sexual awakening at that point? Uh, was it a particularly meaningful time in your own life? Yes, because um, in 1967, that is a very important time for me, because in 1967, I was 20 years old. And then before 1967, I uh, moved back from uh, Taiwan back to Hong Kong in 1964. And uh, when I was in Taiwan, is a martial law, uh, 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 it was under the martial law at that time. And uh, so when I came to Hong Kong, I felt there was a tremendous amount of uh, freedom for me. I can read any books I want or listen to any kind of music I want. It was an uh, awakening time for me. And uh, then uh, I was in love with the music. I was in love with the cinema, literature. And I'm not going to tell you about uh, I was in love, but uh, yeah, that is true. I but I wanted to, did you play any instruments yourself? Yes, I played piano. Piano. Yeah, to write music. Yeah, I, uh, 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 I had a, one of the greatest uh, 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 conductor, John Pritchard, as my teacher back in oh, the days in England. Oh, yeah. fantastic. You were studying in England with him? Yeah, yeah, private student. I was a private student of him. Wow. Yeah, but I started, I think I self-taught many things about the cinema, the music, the writing. I never really go to a school to study something, but I think I absorbed all the experience from the people that I know, the people I met. And uh, I was a very polite person in those days and then very, uh, very, uh, very uh, cheerful uh, young kid. Everybody likes me, and they they uh, they uh, want to tell me what their life stories about their art. So, for instance, I met Erte, I met Henry Moore, I met all those uh, uh, great names. And in uh, in China, I, I know the best uh, uh, painters and all that. I think I absorbed all their energies, and then you I. I want to make a movie, so I put all the energy into the movie. Did you did you consider at one point being a professional musician, a pianist, before you decided on film? No. I mean, I, actually, I should also mention to our audience that you wear many hats. I mean, you yeah. you, are, you you write short stories. You're a photographer. You're a collector of Chinese. Of, of I was a very right? famous as a photographer. <laughs> exactly. So I mean, so I don't want to. You know, to call you a filmmaker is very reductive. 
But was yeah. there a point when you considered being a professional musician? Uh, no, because I think I'm a very lazy person <laughs> to be a professional. I think you're lazy, but okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, to be a professional uh, musician or a composer or whatsoever, you truly has to devote it all your life to that one single instrument, and uh, to. Uh, but I'm not prepared for that because I think that um, I. Uh, I think that I was gifted. Like uh, by by whom I don't know uh, to convey some message to uh, uh, to this world. Either you want to hear or you don't want to hear. That's another thing. But uh, then I was given all those uh, uh, ability to write, to photography, to music, and to uh, uh, movies and all that. But then I realized the best way for me to convey the, uh, uh, the the message is through filmmaking. Many people think that I want to make movies because I want to be famous or whatsoever, but no, I just want to make a good movie for those people that they are concerned with the, uh, the message. So that is the reason why I'm not world famous. I don't, I mean, <laughs> Not many people, they know me, but I still never stop making them. Yeah. When you, so in 1967, it sounds like you were, you found a whole world opened up to you by getting away from martial law and being able to have access to so much art and music and film. Did you, were, was politics an important part of your life as well or not particularly? Yeah, you know. 1967 is, is very important uh, to me because uh, after I came back to Hong Kong, I opened my eyes and uh, having all those um, ingredients uh, uh, that I can absorb. And then there was uh, the riot, the, the continuation of uh, cultural revolution from uh, China to Hong Kong. And then I had this awakening what is happening to this world? Yeah, but at that time, I I saw the riot was uh, on the streets and things like that. But still, I wanted to do something that is uh, uh, meaningful to me at that time. So not only uh, seeing the riot, but I want at that time, I said to myself, I want to do something about uh, love among the ruins because at that time you see Hong Kong is uh, like a, a ruin. And then, so I want to uh, make a movie of love among the ruins or write a novel of love among the ruins. So half a century later, I made uh, uh, Cherry Lane. Describe for those of us who haven't been the neighborhood of North Point, little Shanghai, and you know then and now to us, and what special place it holds for you. You know, because uh, little Shanghai, North Point is very unusual in the fifties and the early sixties, and also to to the uh, early seventies, because it is uh, the time because uh, that uh, the many of uh, the literatis, performers, artistic people, they move from China to Hong Kong and then uh, uh, living in North Point and it seems having their own part of the world is uh, not, all, not the Cantonese. The Cantonese, they were in the centr uh, central part or in Qingzhou, but Shang uh, the little Shanghai is you have Chinese opera, you have uh, uh, all the wonderful Shanghai food, and then you have a nightclub, it's called a Ritz Club. The Ritz Club, it is uh, like a replica of uh, uh, Shanghai's life into Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. They have dancing hall and all that. So it was quite a, a unusual place. It's uh, the kind of uh, two cultures that mixed into one, and that is, the little Shanghai in North Point. And, uh, you know, Zhang, Hai, Zhang Ailing and uh, lived in uh, North Point. And uh, also that in my 
uh, in my movie, there was uh, this state cinema. And unfortunately, that now they, pre they are going to preserve this uh, state cinema, uh, state theater, because this is the only theater that is left through all these years that it is still a theater. Did you show your film in it? Did you show number seven Cherry Lane in it? No, that was because of, because the, COVID the, or... theater, the theater was uh, had a fire and it was shut down for about 20 years. Oh. And then they were thinking of uh, demolish it and uh, all that. And then now there is uh, this uh, uh, big uh, uh, development company, they bought the site. And then they are going to preserve the whole place. I and know. so they are going to do something like a preserving the North Point. So all of a sudden, at this moment, very strange, only this year that the uh, state cinema has become a kind of a, a, um, a talking point. Yeah, because the people talk about the uh, state cinema and uh, then uh, because uh, this state cinema when they renovate they're going to develop it uh, within the next four years so there were a lot of publicity about the state cinema uh -huh. yeah so the, and it, it's having a kind of rebirth is it has the i assume the demographic has changed a great deal over the last 50 years oh yeah, yeah 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 it's yeah not a little shanghai anymore i suppose not because now Hong Kong is international. <laughs> so, so, so North Point is in a very expensive neighborhood. Is it very? Is it middle class? Is it? What is it like now? The, uh, what is like now? It's kind of. Uh, uh, mm, I would. I think before uh, before these two years, North Point is kind of a, a little bit run down, and then. Uh, uh, the people they live kind of a uh, lower middle class uh, way of uh, life because then you have you don't have uh, the literati or the opera singers and living there anymore it's run down but uh, very strange within the last few years there has been a lot of uh, 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 buildings they were uh, wonderful new buildings it's like uh, all of a sudden you have a uh, a Soho or uh, the, the, the city moves there and it becomes young again. So it's, a kind of, it's having a kind of renaissance. Yeah, 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 yeah. And maybe, so, maybe you can persuade them to let us show some uh, MoMA restorations at the state when it reopens. Yeah, I think there will be a lot of uh, uh, big publicity on the salvation. Uh, yeah, because uh, I, I think is starting from uh, uh, last year, the end of last year, because of the company's new world, they are one of the biggest uh, development company and uh, uh, the owner, and he has a heart for uh, art. So he built things like uh, the uh, K-11 art house cinemas, and then uh, the, uh, the new, very interesting new hotels like uh, Rosewood Hotels. And I, I think this uh, developer has a heart for art and, uh, um, yeah. Well, that's exciting to hear. It's exciting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You also spend some time, I mean, if, I think I read that you spent some time in the American Midwest, no? When you yeah, yeah. yeah. Tell, tell us a little bit about those experiences. You were, you were as, as a writer, right? And, and you were doing LA? No. No, no, no. Yeah. Weren't you at the Iowa Writers Workshop? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I was uh, writing you, you, when I was young, from 16 years old. I, I'm i not a very uh, uh, obedient student. When I was a student in my uh, high, uh, high school, I started to write for, uh, for newspaper. So uh, when I was writing, I was quite, I was, uh, uh, quite uh, well known. And then the, the editor says that Yang Fan has the best Chinese language in his pen. Well, <laughs> so when I was uh, in LA, I tell you what I did in LA. I was working as a, a, string, a screen extra. And also uh, I was also in the uh, screen actors field but I stayed there only for one year. You know, 
my movies has never been to Cannes. Yeah, because they said, oh, why don't you uh, push yourself to go to Cannes? I said, why should I? Because my first movie won the Grand Prix in a Cannes Film Festival. That was MASH. I was, that was the first uh, 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 time I arrived. You have a role in MASH? You have a, yes. you have, oh, not a role extra. I was well, extra, extra. But, but, you're, but you're in it, but you're, you made the cut, you're still in the film? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw my, you know. That's funny. This, I have to watch it again. Yeah, this is the whole story. So uh, uh, after I left uh, LA, I stopped over um, uh, in Iowa, and then you know the Chinese people, the, the workshop people, they loved me, and uh, and I met them. They said, "Wow, uh, Paul Engel said, why don't you stay in Iowa and then become a writer, things like that." I said, oh, my, my dream is big. I want to go to uh, Europe. I want to see Europe. So I went to Europe. And then I hitchhiked down to a, a Cannes. And then I saw there was a Cannes Film Festival and there was a mesh. I said, oh, I was in that movie. But then, well, of course, I mean, I was just a student. All those things has nothing to do with me. So later on, I went to uh, Cambridge uh, later on that year, and I vividly remember that one day I went to, uh, 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 I was in Cambridge. So in Cambridge, you have double bill. And uh, so one day I saw that there, were, uh, there was a movie with uh, Brigitte Bardot and uh, uh, Sean Connery. I want to see that movie, that the double bill, the other one is a mesh. So I went to see the movie after the uh, uh, Sean Connery movie. I watched the match and then one scene, all of a sudden I saw I was riding a bicycle from the, in those days, gigantic big screen. I was riding the uh, a bicycle crossing from left to right while, uh, uh, while Elliot Gold was talking to uh, another person, either Donald Sutherland, but only one of them, they were talking. Uh, on the jeep, I was riding. I said, "Oh my God, that was me." <laughs> That's, funny. That's funny. So that did, was my. Did, when you were when you passed through Iowa, did, did the American Midwest have make an impression on you? Just aesthetically, did the did the? Uh, it's a very distinct place. I mean, of course, and it's yeah. also it's also brought so many artists. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. American artists, regionalists have, have yeah, 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 because have, have uh, their yeah. work in the Midwest. Yeah, in Iowa, I you know uh, I met Lin Huai Lin Huai Ming, who is very famous for his um, um, Yunmen Wuji uh, Cloud Gate uh, uh, dance uh, company in Taiwan. I met him. I spent about two weeks in Iowa, and uh, then I met uh, Wen Wen Zhao Liu, and uh, then he wrote this poem uh, poem uh, to uh, to me, and so I write the music. And then after so many years, I put the left tune into this rap. So, you know, the rap music, you have a kind of a lyric singing. That is a, mus a piece of music I wrote uh, uh, some 50 years ago. Yeah. yeah. So after Iowa, Iowa is like a, a dream city. Uh, I, uh, when you were young, I was like a 21 or 22 and uh, full of talent that shows and that everybody loves you you also you love them and then i moved to uh, new york and uh, uh, before i moved to york, new york i went to uh, williams town because uh, i i know some people you know uh, williams college and they think that i should probably go to williams college mm -hmm. and uh, because it's a pre uh, prestige uh, little league and uh, but I, I did not stay. I just went to uh, uh, New York and working and save money and then went to uh, uh, Europe. How long? So you, you're talking about around 1969, 1970. When is this? 70. 70. So were you? Did, how long did you spend in New York? Were you just passing through, or do you? Six months. Six yeah, months. I was staying with my brother, and I, this is the first time that I truly worked. 
and then go to um, go to work early uh, early in the morning. That is a, a bank. It's called the Siemens Bank for saving. I worked six uh, six uh, six months there and I saved money. Yeah, and then uh, I keep on moving. Fantastic. Do you do you? I, I read a quote from a, one of the reviews of your film, The uh -huh. Critic and the Economist, mm -hmm. called your film a rare example of avant-garde conservatism. What do you think that means? <laughs> I was trying to actually decipher I what he actually meant by that. You know, I love that quote because um, to many people that I symbolize luxury, good life, and uh, easy life and all that. But deep inside in my heart, I'm very revolutionary. I am very daring. I try to do things that the people, they, uh, uh, they don't do. So for instance, like uh, the, if uh, you look back into my uh, film uh, uh, repertoire, my uh, first uh, film is called uh, uh, A Certain Romance. It's about two people, they, one glance, they fall in love, but they never meet in the whole movie. But then the love was around, uh, uh, in between them, in the air for all this, uh, uh, this um, uh, uh, all the time. That is a very daring movie. It's a kind of a teenage love movie. But my second movie is with Maggie Chung and the Zhao Yun Pa, big star at the time that, um, uh, uh, Chow Yun Fa was not a box office star, and Maggie Chan just freshly from a, uh, the beauty pageant. And then I make that movie called The Story of Rose. That was a very, very big hit. And uh, so, uh, uh, so, but the subject of that movie, it is incest. It is uh, Chow Yun Fa is uh, uh, Maggie Chan's uh, uh, brother. Actually, they, they were so close to each other, you can always almost feel the incestuous relationship. And then the uh, Zhou Yunfa died, and then Maggie Chang came back to, uh, from Paris to Hong Kong and uh, met another person who looks exactly like uh, her brother and falls in love again very passionately. And then the other, the second Zhou Yunfa was. Uh, killed in the uh, uh, car accident. My third movie was even more daring. It is uh, starring uh, um, uh, Sylvia Chan, Kelly Yao, and a Japanese uh, half rob a Japanese movie star. And that movie is called Immortal Story because I love the uh, name Immortal Story by uh, Orson Welles. Well, it's uh, it's uh, Denison, yeah. of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The author, and the, I mean, but it's a wonderful movie, an underrated yeah, yeah. Wells movie. And the movie was set in Macau, so I yeah. use the name Immortal Story. And that movie is about lesbian. So about uh, more than 35 years ago, you do a mainstream movie, and uh, it is about uh, uh, the love of a lesbian and the normal love, and that was very daring. And then later on, I think the changing point for my, uh, my uh, film uh, career is uh, Boogie Street. Actually, uh, MoMA has shown Boogie Street about 20 years ago in New York, I came. Yeah, and the Boogie Street I shot in Singapore. And it is uh, the first time that I do a live sound. And we use uh, Panavision and loads of uh, lightings moved to Hong Singapore. At that time in Singapore, there was no film industry. So we shot the movie in Singapore with a hip Tai Li. He, she was, uh, at that time, she was right after she did uh, Oliver Stone's Heaven and Earth. So the whole movie is about transvestites and the transsexuals in the uh, Boogie Street, the Black Street in Singapore. And that was uh, my uh, worst uh, box office movie. But then after that movie, none of my movie is a uh, uh, I did it in a confirmist way. It is uh, either it's a, 
uh, Bishonen, it is uh, the boys in love, and then Peony Pavilion is a grand, uh, wonderful piece of work of uh, 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 women in love, and also uh, revive the career of the legendary Ria Miyazawa. And uh, then afterwards, I made uh, Color Blossom, and which is a ghost movie nobody knows because it was so strange and it's so avant-garde. And uh, then afterwards, I made Prince of Tears. And, uh, and now? Now, this is uh, not a conformist uh, movie. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, just to, we should wrap up, I think. But, you know, one of the parallels you make, of course, I mean, the choice of Simone Signore, I was curious to know more about why, why her films in particular. But one clue, it seemed to me, is that Casque d'Or is about a love triangle. Yeah, and, you know, so you have a very similar dynamic as you do in Number Seven Cherry Lane. Of course, the love triangle in Number Seven Cherry Lane is between a mother and a daughter, and then yeah. and a young man. But why Simone Signore in particular? Because I was in love with Simone Signore, that and that. I, yeah, I think you uh, uh, the first time I saw Room at the Top, I was astounded. I mean, a woman that is not so beautiful, but has so much charm that makes all the young people that dying for her and then, yeah, things like that. So I wanted to keep this, uh, her charm in this movie. And, uh, you know, there was a one, one person that he saw the movie and then he cut out the three clips and sent it to me. That is direct from a, a room at the top. But I look at those uh, uh, three clips because I, I, I write the script and then I uh, do the um, uh, storyboard all through my memory. I did not go back to, uh, to check the DVD and uh, things like that. It was accurate. I look at those, those uh, uh, three segments. I had the tears in my eyes. I said, oh my God, I think that I did something that uh, dedicated to uh, this, uh, um, uh, this wonderful movie only through my memories. And I did not copy, I mean, just copy the movie, but I rewrite it in my own way. And it has all the essence of that movie in it. So I felt, that I was truthful to Simone Signore. Well, and so many other things in your film. I think you you did a, a marvelous job in, in paying homage to so many things that you love and have inspired you and yet made something completely your own. So I want to thank you so much for sharing your film and, and your time now with us and speaking about it. Can I say one more thing? Absolutely. You know, for all the things that I made the dedication, that's Oh, it's obvious you have uh, the psycho shower, you have uh, the talking about the Brigitte Bardot, you have, uh, I mean, uh, the blow up. Yeah. Your insinuation, oh, of course, the blow up. You have the insinuation of uh, 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 Cinema Paradiso, but there's one thing nobody can, uh, nobody will uh, uh, notice, but it is my private dedication to Francis Coppola his outsider, because in outsider, the first uh, sentence in the movie, it was not, it was only read, and then uh, it was only read subtitled, and it says, when I stepped out from the darkness of the movie house into the bright light sun outside of the cinema. So that is a scene that Francis Coppola never really uh, shoot that scene, but I fulfilled it for mailing when she left the state cinema and walk on the uh, street. The bright sunlight shines into her eyes. That is my dedication. <laughs> well, lovely. We'll have to make sure that Francis has a chance to see the film, and I hope someday we'll get back to cinema so we can experience that yeah. into the bright sunlight again. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. In the meantime, thank you so much. It really is an honor to be able to show your film. Bye-bye.